Um, well, good morning I'm thank you all for being here. I'm Joanna Barbain and I'm Director General for Digital Society at the Government of Catalonia. <clears throat> Before my introduction of the two great speakers that we have today with us, I wanted to say just a few words to explain why we are organizing these Digital Rights Live sessions from Catalonia. At the end of 2019, the Parliament of Catalonia expressed it to the Charter for Digital Rights and Responsibilities from Catalonia. This charter is a project coordinated by ourselves, by the government of Catalonia, and that aims to promote a legislative and democratic framework to guarantee human rights in the digital age. <clears throat> the Charter for Digital Rights is a social and open innovation project in, in constant construction, so it's building itself and it's, it's not stopping. And people from a wide variety of sectors of society had contribute, contributed to this charter. They have reviewed, amended and improved the proposals. And of course, I invite you to, well, to, to contribute to this charter. By now, the Charter for Digital Rights and Responsibilities from Catalonia includes for the moment the following fields. You can just check in on the internet if you want some information. I think that are now we'll just in we'll just put in the on the chat the link to this charter. So by now we are just um, including these these eight um, fields or these eight uh, rights: universal access to the internet, an open and inclusive internet governance model with multi-stakeholderism, freedom of expression, information digital innovation and creation, access and distribution of knowledge, data protection and information privacy, training and digital inclusion warranty. Also, another right and responsibility is related to artificial intelligence. We want to, well, the title, the title of, the, of, the chart, of the right is regarding ethics in the field of artificial, artificial intelligence and algorithmic governance in public and private sectors, and at least digital rights safeguard me me mechanisms. So this is the, the charter right now. The chart right now, we are working on that, and we, we just aim to, to talk about that. With this charter, the citizens of Catalonia, they, they have proposed from their own perspective how uh, to continue defending human rights in the digital age. So mm, this is a global debate in, in Catalonia and it's still working in, we are still working on that. So we are organizing the, those debates about specific areas of digital rights and responsibilities such as artificial intelligence, freedom of information, the perspective of children and teenagers and the future of work. Today, we, we have the first of these digital rights live sessions from Catalonia. And we want to talk and debate about digital rights and artificial intelligence. Uh, just a quick reminder after the discussion, we will open a Q&A from the, the audience. So if you have any comment or a question, feel free to write them in the, in the chat or in the Q&A, okay? And you can write, of course, in English, in Catalan or Spanish, so feel free and, and we will translate it. And before, well, so going to the, with to the point, uh, let me introduce you the first speaker, Mr. Bernard Steng. Thank you for being here. Mr. Steng uh, joined the European institutions in 1996. Uh, he's currently a cabinet ex expert on the team of executive vice president, Margaret Bestager, dealing with digital matters. Between 2006 and 2019, he held different head of unit positions across the European Commission dealing with e-commerce and online platforms, public interest services, online gambling and postal services. Before that, he was involved in mainstreaming policy evaluation across the Commission, in the negotiation of bilateral and multilateral trade agreements and in the negotiations on regulatory files in the areas of aviation and maritime transport. He earned this, his doctoral degree in economics from the Vienna University of Economics and Business Administration. So. Uh, Mr. Steng, he will talk about European Commission's proposal for regulation on AI. Do you, you know that now it's just with everyone is talking about that. And well, uh, this leg the legislative proposal um, is the first initiative that provides a legal framework for AI. So Mr. T Steng, thank you very much for being here today. So the floor is yours. You have uh, 50 minutes for doing your presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Joanna, for this introduction and also for inviting me to participate in your event. As you rightly said, these issues are being discussed everywhere by everybody these days. But probably before zooming into the AI Legal Act and picking up on what you said on the Charter and, and, and citizens' rights, um, that's also the general framework within which we have proposed the AI Act, if you want. So we have a digital strategy uh, since the beginning of, of this mandate of, of, of this commission, so a bit more, less than two years ago, where we said we want uh, human-centric technology in Europe. So we want, of course, to promote digitization and COVID, the pandemic has shown how much we also all benefit from digital technologies when nothing else works. Um, so we, are, we have a two-pronged strategy. We want to promote the digital transformation but at the same time, we want to make sure that such technology serves the people and not people serving technology. So that's an overarching digital objective of ours, if you want. Uh, and when you read out the elements of your charter, um, this sounds extremely familiar. There will very soon be uh, also a proposal from the Commission to the other institutions, to Parliament and Council, for a for declaration on digital rights, which we hope will be co-signed by all three institutions and which will have very much the same headings that you were reading out, Joanna. Uh, so that's that's very, very nicely aligned. Now, when it comes to AI, the starting point was the same. Um, we did not go into this debate by saying AI is good or AI is bad uh, as a technology, but rather sort of seeing um, how we can make the best of this technology in the interest of our economy, in the interest of our society. So once again, it is with this two-pronged approach. We want Europe to be world-class in developing secure and trustworthy and uh, human-centered artificial intelligence. So we want it both. We want it all. Yeah, We want an ecosystem of trust, of course, in Europe, where we say, well, AI developed, used in Europe, uh, addresses all the, the human and societal risks that are being widely debated. But at the same time, once this is done, we want Europe to be an ecosystem of excellence. And that is why we have been working together with the member states, uh, and we will be working together with the member states to boost investment, uh, research in AI, uh, improve cooperation and coordination across the continent, promote innovation in AI, because we should also not forget that this is a technology that is already here and it will further grow in importance. If Europe is not uh, a strong player in this, we're just the consumer of AI technologies and we have to, to buy what is offered on the global market, which may not always correspond to our values and rights and expectations. So better we ourselves are strong players in AI but we do this in the European way. There's of course a big link between the two pillars of trust and of innovation, because if people don't trust AI, that will obviously slow down uh, its development and uptake. So those two are intrinsically linked. And we do want AI to play its role um, because there are so many uh, benign applications of AI. Uh, so let me start with the positives before turning to regulation and how to address the risks. Um, we have seen it in the pandemic, to what extent the intelligent use of data can help us improve our healthcare systems. Probably we can anticipate the next uh, pandemic well before it hits us. Uh, once it hits us, we may be much faster in connecting the dots, in finding cures, therapies, treatments, so there is a lot of things that, that AI can do in terms of healthcare. We also talk all the time about the Green Deal and we just had the, the global conference on climate change. Um, again, here, um, if you use data intelligently through artificial intelligence, um, you can uh, re improve our energy efficiency tremendously. Just imagine, uh, managing the energy grids, matching supply and demand in the most efficient way, managing buildings, big consumers of energy in terms of heating and lighting, uh, if all of that is optimized. In smart homes, same principles. Mobility, how much different modes of transport are currently 
not being used in an optimal way and, and a lot of traveling um, should never take place or not with half empty vans or cars, reducing waste throughout production. So there's numerous examples as to how um, this technology can help us really move towards societal, uh, societally beneficial objectives. So we want AI to be a force for progress, but for that first we need to build trust in AI systems. And this is what our legal proposal is trying to do. Um, it is currently being negotiated both by the Council of Ministers and in the European Parliament. It will still take a while, obviously, to be, to be finalized. Um, and in this proposal, we were not, as I said at the beginning, trying to regulate the technology. So we did not want an AI regulation that regulates a technology in all of its dimensions. The objective was to look into the way AI is used and on a risk-based approach, try to see um, what are the use cases that seem pr problematic to us and therefore need a regulatory response. So it is a risk-based approach with the emphasis on what we call high-risk use cases. Does this mean that everything that does not fall in this definition uh, is the Wild West? No, it doesn't. We have, a, we have a legal framework in place on fundamental rights, on data protection, on product safety, on whatever, every aspect of life. So all of those laws will continue to have to be respected also for so-called low-risk applications. But where it's particularly high risk, and given, of course, also the opacity, the black box nature of AI, we want to improve the, the transparency, uh, the, the, the way in which AI is developed and used, and enforce uh, these rules and existing laws as efficiently as possible. So in this risk-based logic, um, you have to imagine a bit like a pyramid, if you want, and we have cut it in four parts. And at the bottom of it, uh, as always in the pyramid, you would find, of course, the great majority uh, of items. That will be the AI applications that we consider represent minimal, if any, risk at all. So, I mean, just example, say a filter, a spam filter that recognizes spams is also using artificial intelligence and we don't want spam in our inbox. We don't consider this any, any, in any way risky. Um, use of AI in a factory uh, to minimize the amount of waste produced in the production process. That's just beneficial. We don't see a risk in this. And there's many, many, many more of those. Or if I don't know, Spotify, uh, select songs for me and recommend songs to me. If I don't like them more than I look for another song, I don't think that my fundamental rights to good music would be affected by this. So therefore no specific rules on, on this kind of minimal or no risk scenarios. Then we move up and we say, well, uh, there may be some, there may be some risk in some applications, um, but we, but probably transparency would be enough. An example of this, would be a chatbot. I go somewhere on a website to buy a ticket, to get some help, whatever, and I'm interacting with a chatbot. Um, here we say there's nothing wrong with this, but it would be very nice if I knew I was talking to a machine. So, but then okay, I, get, I get this information um, and then I can take my, my own choice and I can hang up or go somewhere else on, on the internet uh, or I, I keep consuming that service but I know I'm talking to a machine, fair enough. Then of course comes the choosy bit, uh, and that is what we, what we call the high risk use cases. Um, that's the main focus of the legal framework. Um, and they are high risk if they interfere with important aspects of our lives. And there's two main dimensions to this. One is safety health related. AI embedded in products and having some impact on the performance of that product that may change its nature during its use. Uh, and the other group is, is linked to fundamental rights, of course, uh, and that may be non-discrimination, that may be privacy or any other fundamental right. So for example, um, if AI is used for, um, for recruitment purposes, uh, going through CVs and taking selections uh, on who should be offered the job, 
who should even see probably a job offering, who be offered a job, who would be offered a place at university? Um, is it a machine that decides whether my daughter can study here at the Brussels University? Uh, or is it still some human being at the end of the day taking those decisions helped by technology? We're talking about creditworthiness assessment. Will I get a loan or not? But also in terms of products, as I said, uh, you may be buying a self-driving car uh, and that car keeps taking in data and taking decisions uh, that may affect your life or the life or health of other people on the road. Medical devices used by doctors for diagnosis purposes. So there's lots of examples where we consider uh, those decisions. For those decisions, AI, of course, can make important contributions, make our decisions better. Uh, but uh, we need checks and balances. We need safeguards in place. And those safeguards are along the, the typical, um, if you want, headings that are usually associated with trustworthy AI because this has been studied for years and there's been high level groups here and there and everywhere at the international level, OECD in Europe. And we have transformed this into legal obligations. So if you fall under these definitions of high risk use cases. Um, you have to have a sound, first of all, already risk um, management system in your organization. Uh, second, you need uh, high quality data. You need to ensure that obviously the data that go into the system uh, are not uh, biased, are representative, are of good quality, so that the outcomes would not be biased as well and just probably extrapolate existing bias into the future. Because we should not forget that it's not the machine that invented bias. Bias is part of ourselves, it's part of our society, of our culture. But using a machine uh, and not knowing anymore what it does and why it does things may amplify the problem even further. So we need to get the data right. We need to get the documentation right of how the system actually works. That's the explainability dimension. Uh, everybody afraid of a black box. We will never quite understand what is happening really in terms of mechanics, but we need to know what that machine uh, actually does. That also needs to be explained properly to the users of such of such AI solutions. So not just the developers have obligations, but also the users, and they need to be properly informed. If a doctor is using a medical software to, for cancer recognition, that doctor, of course, will be the one taking decisions with the help of the software, but the doctor needs to know the parameters of use of that device, the reliability of that. He needs to have all the caveats, all the health warnings that he or she can use that software to the best, uh, in the best of his, his abilities. Then we need human oversight in the design and implementation of the AI. So if my daughter is not admitted to university because the AI thought she was not worthy of it, there must be a way for her and for me to challenge that and to get some human in the loop to, to eventually correct such decisions. And then last but not least, obviously, we need to have high standards in terms of accuracy of the system. You know, will that cancer be recognized with a probability of 80% or hopefully more in the area of 99.9%? .9 that needs to be known and demonstrated the robustness of the system, its resistance to cyber security or to cyber attacks, if you want. And then we have, uh, and I'll finish with that, we have obviously on top of our pyramid, uh, those use cases and very few where we think of a prohibition because we feel that has no place in our society. Some extreme examples are subliminal techniques that cause physically or psychologically harm to someone. In particular for vulnerable people. Think of a child that gets a toy uh, and that toy uses voice assistance to manipulate the child into doing something dangerous. I mean, these are sort of things we don't want to see here. Same applies to social scoring apps. Where we don't want an app that ranks people on their social behavior and the number of, of, uh, of traffic rules that you have violated and pace uh, rents paid too late and the combination of those social behaviors leading to some sort of ranking which will later on be used by public authorities or by anyone else to take decisions on your behalf. No social scoring in Europe. 
Last example and, and very uh, intensely debated since, ever since we started uh, preparing our white paper a while ago, it's remote biometric identification. Facial recognition is one example of that. Biometrics can be used in many circumstances. Many of them would be not problematic, in particular when it's one-to-one, -one. you have border controls, uh, signing in with your fingerprints or, or face recognition. Um, but in our proposal, we focus on remote biometric identification, many people being screened at the same time. And here we say, whoever uses remote biometrics for whatever purpose, that is highly risky. Uh, and therefore, there is even stricter rules to so those use cases than to all the other high risk use cases. But for one particular case, even that is not enough. And that is real time uh, remote biometric identification in public places by law enforcement. We don't want uh, we don't want mass surveillance in our society. That sort of use is prohibited by principle. So we said it's, it's, it's on the list of prohibited practices, but we are saying subject to very, very strict rules and caveats. There may be exceptions to that. Uh, and that may be, for instance, a missing child or a terrorist on the loose. But as I said, lots of safeguards here to make this highly exceptional because in principle it's forbidden. To conclude, um, we feel that, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, Regulation is not necessarily the enemy of innovation. We think that our framework will still allow uh, Europe to, to invest in identifying and using very beneficial use cases of artificial intelligence, use them to the benefit of our economy, our society, our health systems, educational systems, what have you. Um, but for that, we need trust. Uh, and that is also why this public debate, including the one you are having now uh, in, in, in your country, is so important because you only get trust in technology if everybody gets involved, gets informed, uh, has a voice, can make their voice heard. So that at the end of the day, we are all happy that we have regulated this thing in the right way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Berner. Then, if, uh, if the audience has some question, we will debate about that. But now is the turn for Mar Karma Peiro. Um, Karma is a journalist specializing in ICT since 1995. Currently, she is director of, and co-founder of Visualization, Visualization for Transparency Foundation who is working in promotion open data to empower citizens and accountability of public information. She is also co-author of the report Artificial Intelligence Automated Decisions in Catalonia about ethics and data protection. And she is also a member of the Advisory Council of the Ethics Observatory in Artificial Intelligence of Catalonia and member of the Ethics Committee at the UPC, is Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya. She is lecturer in seminars and debates related to, ethica, to, to, to ethics and artificial intelligence, transparency of information, open data, and digital communication. So, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Peiro, thank you for being here today also, and that's your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna, uh, and thank you very much to the Department of Digital Policies of the Catalan government for inviting me to participate in this uh, cycle of conferences. Uh, it's a pleasure to share also my thoughts with Mr. Bernard Stank uh, in this session dedicated to artificial intelligence. Um, let me share my screen because I have prepared some slides. Um, one second, and please tell me if you can see my slides. Yes? Okay. It's in the presentation, boy? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right now, okay. So over the last five years, uh, I have uh, followed the evolution of this technology, uh, which today shall run us, but in, in an invisible way uh, for citizens. We all agree that AI can bring us considerable uh, advantages and progress as human beings, but it is also true that it carries enormous uh, risks, as Mr. Sten has uh, remarked uh, 
Now, the knowledge of these risks uh, has led me to go deep into the crucial ethics aspects of AI. And I want to focus my intervention on questioning how citizens will deal with these intelligent systems in an increasingly automated society and less controlled by humans. Okay, so um, last time that Cathy O'Neill, she's author of the books of the book Weapons of Math Extraction, and when she came to Barcelona last time, she asked me, will you be able to decide whether a child is in danger at home because he or she will be sexually abused by one of their parents? I didn't know what to answer. <laughs> and she saw my face and add, in the United States, machines are deciding these kind of issues. One algorithm will identify potential victims of abuse before anything happens with a good intention to avoid the trauma for the child. I asked her how a machine could decide uh, this before it happens. And Cathy O'Neill replied to me, it cannot. We know that the United States has all the problematic algorithms that independent media or civic associations have already denounced in the last years. But Europe is not an exception in the malfunctioning of AI. In 19, in, in 2019, Algorithm Watch, a non-profit organization committed to evaluating promote algorithm decision-making processes, published this uh, report, Automating Society. They analyzed the situation with artificial intelligence in 12 European countries, listing examples of automated decision making already in use. It was part, I was part of this report, writing the chapter dedicated to Spain. One year later, they released a new version with more examples. The report denounces how the current services or applications of AI provoke discrimination and unfairness. One of their conclusions is why did companies or governments came up with the idea to use a specific ADM systems in the first place? Is it because a problem cannot be addressed in any other way, maybe due to the complexities associated with the problem? Or is it because automa automation is used to save money? Is it for another reason? To what human and economic cost? And the artificial intelligence uh, mistakes recognized by the cops are a constant trickle into the headlines. So we are in a context where governments have deployed their AI strategies to raise awareness among citizens. In Catalonia, we have the AI strategy and the Charter of Digital Rights and Responsibilities. I was part of the, the, the beginning discussions of this uh, charter. And at more local levels, such as Barcelona, there is also the official documentation. In recent years, the European Union has rolled out its AI strategy and ethical guidelines. And today we have already um, and today we already have a proposal of regulation. We also have hundreds of ethical codes from private companies with the main principles that anyone would like to see preserved to respect human rights. These, effect, these efforts by governments are essential and I'm, I am convinced that we are not at the same point of knowledge today as five years ago when these questions had not yet been formalized. And for citizens, it is also crucial. We can easily think that not everyone is familiar with these approaches of artificial intelligence, nor with its complexity. But I'm sure that in a few years time, there will be more people understanding the benefits and risks 
of this technology than nowadays. And I want to highlight the two essential concepts that European regulation focus on, excellence and trustworthy AI. Excellency and trust are both great purposes, but at the same time, they are very quiet, very ambiguous. How will it be possible to make them a reality? This is the question. <laughs> On the other hand, during the last few years, we have had many times from local and international politicians, experts and owners of big companies that they will always use technology innovation with a human-centric focus. But what does it mean exactly, a human-centered artificial intelligence? Can I blindly trust governments, companies and organizations because they will implement AI without any risk to me as a person or to my family or my cross uh, community? Knowing that this technology may have biases that could harm me, can I trust that they will be mitigated, the governments or the companies, they will be mitigated before implementing these intelligence systems? Can I trust that this technology will not fail? And in case there is a fault that always will be someone responsible, that this person or organization in charge will give me answers about the reason why technology failed in case of damage or injury? Can I trust that there will be reparation? And that these failures will be made public transparently so that others can be alert and learn from the mistakes? Last year, the Catalan Data Protection Authority published the report Artificial Intelligence Automated Decision Making in Catalonia, where I was co-author of this uh, report. The idea was to disseminate the complexity of technology in an understanding way for citizens. And I thought that the best way to do so, it would be explaining more than 50 examples where these intelligence systems are using and using healthcare, the judiciary, education, social issues, business, cybersecurity, banking, employment, or media and communication. All the experts I interviewed for this report clarify that automated decision making is only used in sectors that don't involve life risk for people. And at that moment, and in Catalonia, they told me that in healthcare, the judiciary, and some cases in education, the ADM are only a support for the professional and is not applied in an automatic way. But it is still happening now. In case the answer is yes, for how long? The algorithm that decides, for example, which kind of protection measures needs a woman victim of domestic violence could be right or wrong. It's supposed that the result will be only a support for the police or the judge, but will they question the intelligence system? And will they trust their background if they disagree with the machine? I'm not really sure. The EU uh, regulation is based on great ethical principles to preserve human rights, but ethics can never be global. It is up to an environment, to a community. AI systems will increase discrimination because of how it works, using data and information from the past and applying to the future, for the future. This might reproduce biases and discriminations that already exist in society. And we know that at the moment, there is no way to be sure that we can eliminate them. In this automatic society where we are going, we are clustering people on the assumption that the genetic profiling past is a fair method, method of analyzing a particular context. These data are not questioned. They are taken as truth. 
do, do not critically analyze what we have lost in the past. To focus on a race aspect, we should consider making an individual evaluation. Four, the only way to trust in the excellence in the excellency of the AI systems that EU regulation promote is having algorithmic transparency. That means consider ABM as a whole, not just the technology. We should be able to ask what data the system uses, whether the use of this data is legal, what decision-making model is applied, and whether it has a problematic bias. There is a lack of opportunity for citizens to complain. We need an easy and faster way for potentially affected citizens to go to an authority to make sure their rights are respected. And six, it is essential to increase the critical thinking, not only for the citizens, but also for the politicians inside the government. I would like to finish my, my intervention with uh, this uh, tweet. A few days ago, Karis Sabalit, professor of philosophy at Oxford University and author of the book Privacy is Power, made one analogy with the artificial intelligence that shows us how stupid are these systems nowadays and how much work we have ahead. Um, I'm going to click here. And I'm going to, I don't know if you have seen this uh, tweet. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Let me check this. Uh, two pieces of bread out. Got them. Get a butter knife and get some PB. Take one piece of bread, spread it around with the butter knife. No, Dad, with the peanut butter. I'm just doing what it says. It says, take one piece of bread, spread it around with the, bu with the butter knife. Hold on. Get some jelly, rub it on the other half of the bread. No, Dad, open the jelly. Well, it doesn't say to do that. Put the breads together on top of each other. Take a big bite. Sorry, I had to. I had to make it extremely specific. Oh, good. I'm starving. Take two pieces of white bread out of the bag. Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop a bit of peanut butter out of the A bit? That the means like a lot. <laughs> a bit means a lot? In my world. There we go. You're doing better than before, though. Open the jelly jar. Squeeze it onto the other piece of bread. No. Done. Closer. Brad, get some peanut butter. Take the peanut butter knife. Open the peanut butter. Put the knife in the PB. Get some jelly. Open the jelly. No. Squirt the jelly onto the bread. Take the butter knife with the peanut butter on it. <laughs> Wipe it all over the piece of bread that's blank. Take the butter knife, rub the jelly all over the piece of bread. Oh, he's doing better. Oh. <laughs> that's all over. <laughs> Put the two pieces on top of each other. Take two pieces of white bread out of the bag. Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. Okay. So, um, I think it's a, also a good analogy, you know, to understand if we are humans, the, uh, humans that will pay people are the kids and the artificial intelligence, the, 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 the man. So, um, Thank you, um, thank you for, for um, attending me, and I'd be delighted to come in some other aspects of this uh, regulation with Mr. Steen. Thank you, Karma. Fantastic tweet. That's very, very amazing. That's amazing. So now um, let's talk about what what we what we discussed. At this point, uh, at this point, I would like to introduce you, Mr. Roberto Royo 
who will conduct this the, the discussion between the panelists. Mr. Royo is a political scientist who has always been involved in the fields of public affairs, government, communications, and international relations. He is mainly focused on civic tech, public diplom diplomacy, and EU, EU affairs. And he is behind the organization of this series of live sessions in digital rights and responsibilities that we are um, <clears throat> running in Catalonia. So, Mr. Royo, thank you very much for your participation. So um, now you have uh, just 10 minutes for, for, for having this conversation with, with the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna, and good morning to everyone. Um, I would like to invite you, all the audience, to put your questions on the chat or in the QA, Q &A, uh, section. I'll try to, to moderate uh, this discussion. And first and foremost, I would like to offer Bernard the possibility to react to Karma's presentation, interesting presentation, because she touched very different issues. And I'm sure that uh, Bernard has uh, some reaction. So please. Yeah, thank you much for this opportunity. And also thanks to Karma for her presentation. I think um, it matches pretty well what I have presented. One in, in simplified term, one could say I focused on the solution or the way how we consider the solution to look like. And Karma sort of presented the reason for our action in the first place, a bit the problem analysis. The, the question is just how well does our solution fit to the problem that you have identified? Yeah? Have we gone far enough, are we ambitious enough in addressing all the valid problems that you an analyze? So there was nothing in your presentation that I, that, that I would disagree with uh, in terms of challenges to be faced. And the question is whether our, our response to this was sufficient. A bit more specific comments still, since you mentioned ethics uh, quite often, that's an interesting one. We also had this debate. Is this about ethics, uh, ethics only? Uh, what is trustworthy AI? Because many of the use cases that I mentioned would not be about ethics. It would be about respecting our laws, right? Because if it's, for instance, I mean, we have lots of laws about non-discrimination and fundamental rights and about data privacy and about product safety and product liability, what have you. So quite often, it is not that we will be creating new rights with our legal framework, but we try to make sure that existing rights can be enforced because this lack of, of, this lack of transparency and understanding of what is going on becomes apparent and then you can you know, enforce existing rights and laws. There are some ethical questions, of course, for instance, whether AI should be used in autonomous weapons. You know, do we want to weapons to you know, do what they want? Uh, not part of this legal framework, by the way, because defense is outside the scope here. But when I mentioned the remote real time biometrics, that's already one ethical issue. Do we want this in our society? Do we want to give the power to the police to use this around the clock in public spaces to trace each and every one of us uh, and compare this with some sort of databases? So there's a bit of ethics, and but there's a lot of, of rights involved. You mentioned algorithms and algorithmic transparency quite extensively. Of course, we are addressing this in the AI Act to the extent that AI technology is involved. Uh, which is not always the case. Algorithmic transparency is also important in areas where there may not be AI, strictly speaking, involved and learning and so on. And there, just to say, we have a lot of initiatives out there that address the phenomenon of, of algorithms and the risks that come with it. We have the platform to business regulation that business users, hotels using booking.com would better understand, uh, you know, why the, why the consumer is seeing some uh, hotels rather than the other. We have a platform workers initiative coming up where sort of an algorithm may decide the tasks that I'm being given, you know, as a ride for ride hailing purposes, delivery purposes, whatever service I'm offering through a platform. If an, if an algorithm decides uh, whether or not I will be offered the task, whether or not I will be kicked off the platform, there, we also need uh, more transparency and more redress. We have the Digital Services Act where we are saying we need more transparency for recommender systems. Why am I offered a product as a consumer? Why am I seeing in my news feed what I'm seeing? In other words, what am I not seeing, for instance? Yeah? We also, so there's lots of things around algorithmic transparency. Uh, last but not least, you also mentioned the trust in authorities and the enforcement of the whole thing. That is and will be a challenge. 
of course, we are giving enforcement powers to authorities, right? If there's complaints, if there's doubts as to whether our rights are respect, our our obligations are respected, we give them the day access to the data, access to documentation, access to the records that have to be kept by those using AI systems. But of course, you still need authorities and enforcement bodies that actually understand what they are looking at. So we also need to make sure that there's capacity building in the public domain in order to enforce our wonderful new laws. Thank you so much. Uh, we already have uh, a couple of questions coming from the audience. There is one question for Mr. Stang. Uh, there is a certain concern that some of uh, the hot topics of the regulation, like facial recognition for security purposes, lacking a clear consensus, maybe less for national regulation. What are your thoughts on this matter. There is a second question from Mr. Pardo, uh, which is a bit more general. What is your position about the huge amount of energy and critical materials needed to implement digital digitalization? These materials are mostly in the global south and its extraction produces hard ecological and social damage. That's something that both of you can react uh, on. And, and there is a third question coming from Monica as Table regarding the AI regulation presented by the European Commission. Do you have any comments about it? I guess this is a question for uh, Karma. So if you want Karma, you can take the floor now and then we pass it to uh, Bernard. Sorry, uh, can you repeat the last the last question? Because I, I don't yes. see the question. It, it's, on, it's, it's on the chat. Basically, it's asking you for your thoughts about the, the, the Commission's regulation a general comment on, on the proposal coming from the Commission, which is being discussed now uh, in, in Parliament. Okay, do you want to answer first or, or Mr. Stank? Answer? Please, please, you, you can answer now, Karma. Okay. So first of all, I, I believe that this is a relevant uh, regu regulation. We need this regulation. It is necessary to control the potential that uh, the implementation of AI could have to damage and, uh, and endanger people's lives. Um, but also under the, the citizen's perspective, I think it's, it's really scary that, uh, imagine, as I, as, as I said uh, before, uh, not uh, everybody has to be aware uh, about artificial intelligence and, and its complexity. And we have here uh, the European Union that presents a, a proposal of law uh, uh, that recognizes uh, risk uh, as the unacceptable risk and huge uh, risk uh, as a category or level uh, of category, and the others that maybe uh, could be masked as lower risk, but also can do uh, very uh, harmful for, for people. And, and uh, one of the concerns of this uh, proposal uh, is that, in my uh, opinion, is that the, the proposal leaves to the member states. <coughs> To designate one of more one or more national competent authorities to supervise the application and implementation, and here we could find uh, differences on how this control is done. Each country should demonstrate that the technology to be used does what it claims to do, because you will never be able to audit all the algorithms in all the state members. How will the governments control companies that develop the algorithms on their behalf? So this is a, a question that uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know how the, the, the European uh, Union will do. And the other thing is that it is urgent to involve civil society uh, stakeholders in the current discussion and the development of criteria for good design processes and audits. I'm not thinking only in academia, groups of computer scientists or lawyers. I'm thinking in civic organizations and organizations focus on rights because right now they are not part of the conversation and critical viewpoints are being missed. And, and, and one uh, other thing that I could say, and this is, is this part of uh, the voice of uh, Algor Algorite, uh, that is a civic organization, uh, that participated yesterday also here in Barcelona in a, in a very relevant um, uh, event. Uh, they say that there is, there is a lack of knowledge and dissemination about algorithmic uh, injustice in terms of vulnerabilities of human rights. We need new shared framework, we need new voices, new narratives uh, focused on global justice and human rights. 
Bernard, please. Yes, um, on the on the two questions, on the facial recognition question and the energy question. First, on facial recognition, and there's also a link a bit to what what Karma just said about uh, enforcement in the member states, trust also in the member states as users of of AI technologies themselves. Um, of course, you will have seen that uh, if you have looked into our draft law, that in our high risk use cases. Uh, most of them actually apply to the public sector. So we have some of them that also apply to the private sector, as I said, when it comes to employment, to universities, to credit worthiness assessment and so on. But there's a lot of obligations on actually public authorities to be the first that have to be ethical in or trustworthy in the application of, of technology. So law enforcement purposes, for instance, but also in the judicial system or for asylum and immigration, for predictive policing or for remote biometrics, as I mentioned before. So there's a lot of uh, public sector activities that are that are directly covered by the obligations themselves. Now, you can, of course, ask the question, Karma, who supervises the supervisor? Interesting debate, probably not in the nine minutes that we still have. But linking to the question from the audience now, um, when this, when member states started discussing our proposal, the first debate was about law enforcement. So there were there was a big division within the member states, sort of saying one part, the ministers of the economy usually or others would would be following our logic of this risk based approach and covering any high risk case in the same way, irrespective of whether it's the private sector or the public sector. And then we had the ministries of the interior. Uh, that had a different narrative and said, oh, you're making it very hard on us to use AI. Uh, the criminals can do what they want, but we trying to catch the criminals, we are subjected to strict rules and they are excessive. So we had this big debate uh, and they wanted a special framework for law enforcement, arguably to make it less, uh, less strict than our general framework. I think that is behind us. There seems to be consensus at the current state of negotiations. No, uh, all these law enforcement purposes will be part of our proposal. Um, your, your, so lack of consensus, I would not, I would argue, is no longer there on the principle. There is, uh, however, of course, a strong element of subsidiarity here that many things are in the competence of member states. Even if I take remote biometrics as an example, uh, we have a legal framework at European level, the Law Enforcement Directive, which currently actually says law enforcement may use AI uh, for, for remote biometrics. If you are well, not AI, it doesn't refer to AI, but it may make use of remote biometrics under certain conditions. And we turned this round in our proposal and said, no, that's a general prohibition. If ever you want to use it, you will have to meet very strict tests and safeguards to make this happen. But at the end of the day, it will still be for individual member states. And that's not for lack of consensus, but that's our legal system, actually to establish a legal basis for this and say within the framework that the EU has decided, we are going to use technology, this, this, we make use of this option in the following ways. So we are limiting in a way the scope um, but it's still member states, of course, play their role. But that's not lack of consensus. That is how Europe functions. One quick answer on the on the climate uh, implications. So of course, a big debate. We are having this twin transition to digital transformation to green transformation, and we know from digital it plays two roles. On the one hand, of course, it may help green the planet. And I gave the examples before in my introduction. You know. Uh, energy efficiency and mobility and buildings and what have you. At the same time, digital, of course, itself is a has a big uh, carbon footprint and that we need to reduce as well. And that can be both sort of data centers, energy waste, you know, how can we reduce that? How can we use the heat probably that is generated for heating purposes? Uh, how can we make uh, electronic devices more sustainable, you know, that they last longer, that they can be repaired more easily, that uh, they can be recycled more easily. Down to the ethical questions, coming back to ethics that you mentioned in your question, uh, that's about supply chains. Uh, there's also a proposal coming out on sustainable corporate responsibility. How do people source their inputs, uh, you know, if there's global supply chains? 
very good question, very important. If I, if I have some minutes, uh, I would like to add something. Yeah, you have, you have a minute, Karma, please. Okay, okay. So I would like to bring up uh, here uh, uh, the words of Renata Avila. She participated yesterday in this event that I mentioned, and Mr. Stang um, also made a, a video a presentation. Uh, Renata Avila, she is the president of the Open Knowledge Foundation, and she pointed to a significant uh, issue in this debate. Um, the EU regulation will take at least five years, no, five years more from now to be implemented. I, this is a question from Mr. Stein, more or less. Five years to be implemented. More or less. Okay. So the other question is, what we do in the meantime? <laughs> we should, she, she says that we should advocate for a slow AI. Uh, in a similar way to analogy to a slow, a slow food, to identify faults and make them transparent, to learn, involving citizens in, 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 a, in a, a small scale from municipalities, maybe, with respect, respect for privacy systems by default and by design, insurances for measuring and preventing the damage from the companies that will build the algorithms hyperlocal policy initiatives, initiatives, etc. So in conclusion, I'd say that we need to protect our tangible world. We need to protect our relationships as human beings. Governments must decide whether it is appropriate to employ an algorithm within a specific context or maybe not. We don't need artificial intelligence for everything in our lives. We could use uh, this technology only in those applications that don't suppose the substitution of human abilities, rather it complement them. For example, there are very routine, tedious or math mathematically very complex tasks that machines can perform uh, very easy. However, it doesn't seem reasonable to me that a robot does a surgical intervention instead, instead of a doctor or that a machine writes the articles of journalists or uh, evaluates the knowledge of students at the school. And the, my, my, my last uh, sentence could be, the bet for innovation must not kill humans' creativity. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Karma. So, Werner, you have a couple of minutes uh, to, to react to Karma's question. This is a very, I would say, important question. When do you expect this, this regulation to be passed? And if you can also, in a sentence, describe uh, uh, what do you mean with this European way between these uh, Chinese and US approaches? Just one minute. Uh, so yeah, out of artificial time, intelligence. Just one minute. I'd like to be, you know, with a time. Yeah. Just one minute. Okay, okay, just one minute, please, Bernard. So oh, timing, I, I think three years is probably more realistic because we may need another year to finalize the negotiations. And then it's a regulation that will apply directly in the member states, so we don't need a transposition process. Um, I like your ethical questions and your, no, not, not even ethical questions, is sort of, we should still have choices in our lives as to when and how and why we use technology. So I think that is why everything around awareness, transparency, accountability is so important that people can make informed choices about many aspects of our digital lives. Um, I'm saying this so briefly because of this one minute. Uh, the European approach, uh, it's true, we call this the European way. Uh, well, it's quite obvious that the Chinese way may be slightly different in terms of data use and, and, and democratic oversight and control of what is happening. The European way definitely is, as I've said, this human-centric way, the rules-based way. Uh, that's probably the values are the same in the US. I would consider us as like-minded continents, if you want. We have a different regulatory reflex, however, probably, that on top of this vision of human-centric AI, we also trust more in the rule of law, in, in democratically legitimized uh, activities in a way. So we don't just trust business to do what we would want them to do. In doubt, we try to have laws in place that make that happen. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bernard. Thank you, Bernard. Joanna, over to you. Perfect, Mr. Steng, merci. Thank you. 
Well, uh, just for finishing in doing the closure of this uh, dialogue, it's about, we talk about um, how, how can we combine trust and innovation or ecosystem of excellence. So um, how this, they are not opposite, but we need to, to work in trust and innovation. Then we've talked about also that it's not a question of technology, but the use that humans make of it. So this is, I think that's the point. And finally, that we need to involve academic, civil, civil society, governments and industry for working on that because it's not just a thing of one of these uh, stakeholders, it's a, it's a global uh, position. And then for finishing, in, this is, I think it's important to, to make a reference about that. It's, it's a question of time. So Mr. Steng, he has, take, he has said that it could be at least three years to, to work on that, but the question is, in the meantime, what we have to do? So, well, maybe um, dialogue, dialogues like this, because we are just contributing to the debate with this kind of, uh, of action. So as a Catalan government, we, we try to, well, to keep this idea and to give us our ideas for contributing to this, this, um, this discuss. So thank you, Mr. Steng, Mrs. Peiro and Albert Royo for being here today. And we'll wait for you in the next session. I think it's in 15 days, if I don't remember, but you have the just uh, in, in the chat all the information. So I'll hope that the 34 people, 33 now, that it's uh, participating in this debate, he will join us also in 15 days. Thank you very much. Thank you Good. for having me. Yeah. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.